Yeah, I'm going to call us back to order now. I'm going to call us back to order now. I'm going to start by, uh, again, just telling you uh, who these lovely people are <laughs> sitting to my left. Uh, this panel will be moderated by Daniel Wilf Townsend. He is an associate professor at Georgetown Law. Uh, I think there's a couple of paper copies of his uh, recently published paper on assembly line plaintiffs uh, published in the Harvard Law Review. Uh, I read it when I started this job and it taught me a lot about the activities in state courts going on these days that I didn't, didn't know about. So thank you for being here. Uh, next to Daniel is April Kuenhoff. She is an attorney with the National Consumer Law Center uh, where she's developed an expertise about Debt, to, debt collection activities uh, and what's currently going on in the state courts in that regard. Uh, Susan Chin, I haven't met you yet, but thank you for being <laughs> here. Uh, she, uh, NYU Law is a, proud to say she is a, an alum. She is the legal director of the New Economy Project. Uh, project. She oversees that organization's direct legal services uh, to New Yorkers who need lawyers but can't afford them. With us. Uh, Nicole Summers, welcome. Uh, uh, professor Summers is an associate professor of law at Georgetown, um, and she teaches, among other things, property and housing law uh, to first year students. Uh, she has an illustrious academic background, of course, but she also has extensive on the ground experience as a lawyer defending those who find themselves in eviction proceedings. Uh, and finally, uh, Professor Weary, uh, thank you for being with us. We convinced him to join all these lawyers today. <laughs> he was a little nervous, but I think it's going all right. Um, he's a professor of sociology at Princeton, and he is the director of the Dignity and Debt Network. He is an authority on the impact of debt on a person's ability to live in dignity. So I'll turn it over to them now. Thank you all for being here. Um, all right, thank you. I uh, wanted to start just by echoing the first panel's thanks um, both to everyone here at NYU for organizing the conference and also to all of you for, for coming and sharing your thoughts um, and being up for hearing, hearing our thoughts. Um, uh, the, the first panel that we heard this morning uh, was you know, broadly system focused. And I think we heard a lot of, a lot of issues about how multifaceted um, civil justice reform really is. And I, you know, I think that when we think about how people actually experience the civil justice system, I mean, first of all, as we heard, they don't always think this is the civil justice system. Sometimes they just think, you know, these are a variety of different institutions that I encounter in life. And they don't divide their lives up into the categories that might be familiar to, to the law or legal systems. You know, uh, a debt problem can also be a health problem, can also be a family problem, can also be a housing problem, um, or you can have multiple problems that are, you know, blurred edges across all of those categories. Um, but, the, the law does make those distinctions, both in um, its you know, substantive provisions and then also in the procedural and institutional ways that we deal up um, dispute resolution and problem solving. So um, this panel is a little more focused on, on specific substantive issues, though as, as I'm sure we'll find out, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of trans substantive issues that arise, that arise here as well. Um, we have, as you, as you just heard, experts on, on debt collection issues um, and also on housing issues. And so we'll dive a little bit more into, into substance, um, although I think everyone should feel free to, to talk more broadly about the themes that we've heard, that heard on the first panel and we'll probably be hearing throughout the day as well. Um, the way we're gonna go about it is I have got questions sort of for each, each of the folks here um, and then we'll maybe ask some more open-ended questions and then uh, hopefully we'll open it up to the, to the audience uh, as well. I think we'll probably have time, have time for that. Um, all right, so first off, a uh, question for April. Um, as I was you know, just talking about, a lot of the conference today so far has focused on these trans substantive issues of you know, sort of how courts are organized and um, thinking about courts as institutions. Um, but given that debt collection suits in particular make up so much, <laughs> such a large part of courts dockets and, and given your expertise on fair debt collection laws, I thought uh, I would ask if you wouldn't mind sharing some thoughts about the substance of debt collection in, in civil justice reform. So when you look at debt collection and, and debt as an issue, what are the kinds of reforms to substantive law 
that might help ameliorate the, these problems that courts and litigants are facing right now? And how should we prioritize between reforming sort of substantive issues of, of debt um, and procedural protections that litigants see when they, when they go into courts? Hi, everyone. Um, I, I do want to say briefly, when, when we start talking about debt collection reforms in, in the states, one of the resources that we have, which I'm holding up here for, for the Zoom uh, folks in case you can't see it, is um, NCLC's uh, Model Family Financial Protection Act, which is a place to begin thinking about possible state reforms. And it's not something that we ever intend a state to enact in, in, in the full uh, statutory form that we put it forth, but it's more of a conversation piece, different ideas that we have uh, about how states might reform uh, debt collection laws. And, and when we think about reforming state laws around debt collection, uh, we've worked with states in terms of reforming statutes. We've worked with different actors who are drafting regulations uh, courts drafting court rules or court procedures. Uh, so I think that there's many different doors to reform uh, around debt collection in particular. I wanna highlight today a few places within uh, the court process where these kind of court reforms, or excuse me, where these uh, debt collection reforms broadly may come in. But I also wanna constantly think about the fact that when we talk about debt collection, there's uh, many cases that never reach the courts. So uh, reforms that are related to all of the people who may have past due accounts that uh, are in collection, whether by the original creditors or by debt collectors or debt buyers. So there are a lot of people who may never reach the courts, but who still have legal issues related to debt collection. In terms of the courts themselves, some important areas to think about when we talk about debt collection reform are, first of all, notice and service of process. Do people who are sued actually have notice of uh, the proceeding? And uh, do they understand what they need to do next and why they need to do it and who this party is that's suing them? Which is a really important issue to bring up in, in the debt collection arena because there are so many lawsuits filed by debt buyers who are parties frequently that the, that the consumer has never heard from before because it's not uh, the original creditor to whom they owe the debt. Um, I, Susan is gonna talk uh, more about kind of sewer service and, and service of process issues. But uh, you know, I think that there are many other issues to address uh, when we think about uh, service of process, for example, Massachusetts small claims court, the uh, approved method of uh, service of process is just first class mail. And so, uh, you know, we, we know that that's not very effective and uh, that continues to be the method that is used in, in that court. Um, I, I think that separate from the kind of rules around service of process, there's also just practice uh, that can be changed in some cases. Another example from Massachusetts is I know that that first class mail notice that goes out often goes out six months or more before that small claims hearing. And uh, there's no other further communication from the court. So um, if you compare that to your dentist's office, where maybe you made the initial appointment uh, six months out, and then uh, you know you might get an email, a call, a text message. I, I, you know, it's it's very different the interaction with the court system, and uh, the Massachusetts Attorney General's office actually began a process of sending additional notice, and maybe ten days before the person was scheduled for the hearing, and not surprisingly increased. Uh, the actual appearance rates in those courts because uh, people either hadn't gotten the original notice or just hadn't remembered <laughs> that original notice. So notice the content of it, how it's sent out and um, how people actually receive it and understand what they need to do next. Other process, um, sorry, uh, other issues to think about 
are filing, and I, this came up in the first panel, but what, uh, what information needs to be filed when the complaint is filed? Um, in particular, this is a reform that some states have implemented around uh, filings by debt buyers because there has been such a big concern around um, the, the sale of debts and transfer of these uh, assets without any underlying documentation. And so one of the things that this reform is designed to do is to make sure that, that all parties who are coming before the court actually have documentation to support the claim that they're filing and um, in, in courts that have adopted that actually don't permit the filing until that documentation is available. So um, we've also seen that in other states uh, as uh, documentation that needs to be filed before a default judgment can enter. So we've seen um, both approaches in different jurisdictions. And I, there's a lot more to say, but I just want to kind of shift briefly to um, some post-judgment reforms as another area which uh, I think there's a lot of potential reforms that can be made. Um, one is around uh, bench warrants or capious warrants and, and how they're issued. Um, again, an example from Massachusetts, we've found that uh, in the courts, they were frequently being awarded uh, as a standard practice. So the consumer wouldn't appear for a further hearing, a payment review, and uh, the magistrate was simply issuing in every case a KPS or a bench warrant as the next step in, in the proceeding. So uh, that's a case where, you know, simply reforming the practice, you might not even need to reform the rules. Um, and then we have spent a lot of time at the National Consumer Law Center working with states around laws and practices related to wage garnishment, bank account levies, um, filing of liens and uh, homestead protections to try to lessen the impact of some of these really heavy handed post judgment uh, collection remedies. So I'm gonna stop there because I've spoken a lot. That's great, thank you. Um, so next up for Susan, um, you've worked on protecting consumers both you know, via direct legal services and then also via some pretty high profile impact litigation. Um, among other things, you were involved in the, the Sykes v. Mel Harris litigation, which we, we were talking about earlier, um, which is one of the major high dollar value abusive <laughs> debt collection uh, lawsuits of the last decade um, and settled for nearly, I think, $60 million. Um, so I thought I would ask you to reflect on how much you think this kind of high impact litigation is a uh, model going forward for these kind of civil justice reform efforts. Is this, is, so we put, should we put a lot of our hopes on it playing a robust role in consumer protection efforts, or should we focus more on retail case level reforms? My short answer is we need both, but we also need more than, than those. Um, the Sykes class action lawsuit was really tremendous. It exposed a deeply fraudulent business model it curbed the extraction of massive amounts of wealth from New York's low income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. It restored that wealth to those neighborhoods. And it also led ultimately to the vacature of hundreds of thousands of default judgments that the debt collectors had obtained through fraud. And it also helped to develop good case law. So there's a legacy to that um, around some of the worst debt collection assembly line litigation abuses, such as sewer service, which is this phenomenon where debt collectors intentionally and routinely fail to serve people with notice that they've been sued and then file false affidavits with the courts claiming people have been properly sued. And also around the practice of robo-signing where we would see the debt collectors routinely filing false affidavits claiming to the courts that they had proof of their claims that they did not actually have. So a class action like that, like Sykes, definitely plays a robust role in furthering both racial and economic justice. And I think other kinds of impact litigation can also play a role. So for instance, 
we're bringing an appeal right now um, that's a very different kind of lawsuit. It's um, from Sykes, obviously. It's on behalf of an individual, but we think it has potentially huge implications for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who've been denied their day in court. Um, so what we've seen is that some New York courts are severely eroding basic due process rights. And we think it is you know, partly at least a consequence of this assembly line litigation. So we've seen a lot of these courts hold that if you learn about a default judgment against you and more than a year goes by before you attempt to challenge it in court, you've automatically waived your right to challenge that default judgment. And that is even if you were never served with notice of the lawsuit, the court doesn't have personal jurisdiction over you, or if the, the, the judgment was obtained through fraud, and even if you just simply lacked the legal, re, the legal knowledge and financial resources to bring that challenge to the judgment any sooner. Um, so we're really disturbed by this trend in the case law because for us, this shows that the courts are completely disregarding many of the structural obstacles that low income New Yorkers face to asserting their legal rights. And it effectively punishes them for being poor or lacking um, representation. Uh, so we're hoping that this kind of impact litigation also can help many, many low income New Yorkers. Um, but yeah, so I, I think any kind of impact litigation like that is really important, but there's, there are just too many systemic problems and too much need for more immediate relief than litigation can provide. So we at New Economy Project and along with our colleagues, fellow advocates, we also employ a lot of other strategies. So direct legal services, litigation, policy advocacy. We try to get as much media coverage as we can on these issues. We put out reports. And I think, um, and this was alluded to in the first panel, probably the most important is storytelling. And so we really try to prioritize that with the callers to the legal assistance hotline that we operate, where we are trying to elevate the stories of the people who are experiencing abusive and discriminatory financial practices firsthand. And I have a lot more to say on debt collection, but I'll leave it at that for now. No, that's great, thank you. Um, for Nicole, I thought I'd ask you a question uh, about some of your recent research. Um, you know, I think uh, probably on many people's minds this conference, I imagine cost is at the you know at the front of their mind, and there's there's you know, the cost of litigation, the cost of running courts. I think there's a, a standard narrative in um, the litigation world that when parties settle and it can save the cost of litigation, that's a good thing. Um, but you've um, taken a pretty thorough look at settlements in the in the eviction context, and you've seen how. Um, landlords can use settlement terms to do an end run around a lot of procedural protections for tenants. So I guess, you know, given, um, given, you know, these costs and benefits of settlement, how do you think courts should strike a balance between encouraging productive settlements um, in, in the housing context and avoiding the kinds of problems that you've identified? And what kinds of, you know, how can that balance be struck both, you know, what is the right balance and also what are the tools available to strike that balance? Yeah, great. So I think to answer that question, you really have to sort of step back and think about well, what is a productive settlement in the context of an eviction court or generally. Um, and I think generally you think about a productive settlement as a settlement where both parties are gaining something and they're sort of getting something better or more than what they would get in the alternative, the alternative being generally litigation going to trial. Um, I think the tricky question in thinking about that in an eviction context in particular is that when you think about sort of what's the alternative, what's the other outcome that you're comparing against when you're thinking about, is this a good productive settlement? Um, is that, are you thinking about it in the world that we currently have in eviction court, which is this highly unequal, largely dysfunctional system where there are these huge inequalities in bargaining power. Um, so are you thinking about, is this a good settlement for what the parties could get compared to what they would get if they went to trial in this current system? Um, or are you thinking about it as, this is a good settlement compared against what the party should get, what they are actually entitled to in an alternative world with a much better functioning system. Um, 
And I think you really have to kind of be thinking about it in the latter way. If you think about it in the former way of, is this a good settlement compared to what the parties could get in the current dysfunctional unequal world, um, then the settlements we have are probably are productive. Um, tenants probably are getting more than what they would get if they took their cases to trial. Um, because unfortunately the way that that system is set up where um, particularly in an urban context, most, uh, the overwhelming majority of landlords have lawyers, the overwhelming majority of tenants do not. Um, judges act as sort of passive umpires, um, calling balls and strikes, applying the rules of evidence rigorously. Um, tenants have really, uh, most tenants have really no ability to win anything on their own. Um, but so if you think about sort of how do we get to a world of more productive settlements in eviction court, um, and what tools do courts have sort of within that definition of looking at a more comparing and sort of a more idealized world. Um, I think there are a lot of things that courts can do. I think first there are some things that can sort of be done around the edges to make things marginally better. So there are things like having a default settlement form um, that the court sort of presents to parties that judges more sort of um, interrogate parties when they deviate from that. Um, there are things like having trained mediators in the court to facilitate settlement. I think those things can make somewhat of a difference. They can sort of make things a little bit better around the edges. Um, but my general experience from looking at eviction settlements, from practicing for a long time in eviction court is that that's not gonna make a sort of dramatic enough difference. Um, I think you really have to sort of address the inequalities in bargaining power um, that are so, so extreme um, in eviction court. Um, and so I think there are sort of three ways generally that that can happen. Um, I think one is that you can add more lawyers and legal advocacy to the other side. That's sort of been the traditional solution to a lot of this, um, sort of the traditional way that we think about equalizing power in courts. Um, the second is that you can sort of change what the alternative looks like, basically what the courtroom looks like if people were to take their cases to court, um, as that's sort of the alternative that people are weighing against um, when they are in settlement discussions. Um, and I think one way that you can do that is through having more sort of active judging in the courtroom, have judges um, provide more assistance to pro se litigants, have judges um, relax the sort of procedural rules, rules of evidence. Um, as Colleen Shanahan and Alex Mark and their co-authors have written about extensively, um, that is hard to do. And there are a lot of reforms that have to be made in order for that to happen and happen well. There have to, there have to be major reduction in docket loads. Um, there has to be real training and information provided to judges about how to do that well. Um, but I think in a world where judges did more of that, um, then tenants would basically have a lot more leverage um, in settlement negotiations to negotiate better settlements. Um, I think the third major way in the context of eviction courts um, that bargaining power could sort of be equalized in settlement negotiations um, is to add more process and to slow things down. Eviction courts are places where um, things happen very, very quickly. Um, it's, it's such a huge contrast to sort of how civil litigation works in the federal courts or in other um, more sort of courts of general jurisdiction at the state level. Um, it can, in some places, it can happen as quickly as a week or a few days, even in places with slightly more drawn out processes, it's maybe a month or so. Um, and there's very, very little process involved as sort of the default. Um, and I think that generally tends to favor landlords hugely and tenants are in a situation where they're really faced with deciding whether they are gonna take the risk of losing their home today or getting a little more time um, by settling. And so I think um, reforms that could sort of slow the process down would generally help um, equalize the bargaining power a bit and get tenants out of that really difficult situation um, that they're in now. One thing, um, I also come from Massachusetts perspective, so you're going to get, you're getting a lot of Massachusetts perspective on this panel. Um, but one thing that Massachusetts recently did in the, um, as a sort of pandemic reform that they've um, to date kept in place is that they, um, it, the traditional process had been to have the first court date be the trial date, um, which tenants were generally unaware of partly because of the way the court forms were written um uh, but just put people in such a hard place if i didn't decide do i go to trial this afternoon or do i settle and and give myself a little more time what they did as a reform in the pandemic was that they made the first court date the mediation date and then set a second date for trial down the road if the parties didn't settle um and that that was something that advocate tenant advocates had been pushing for for a very long time um as a way to get tenants out of that sort of difficult um, super fast situation. Um, I think also when I just drawn um, a 
idea that Diego Zambrano had um, more generally that he wrote about in a recent paper in Columbia Law Review to have sort of default discovery um, in lower level state courts. Um, as he writes about discoveries basically absent um, from a lot of these specialized courts, which really disadvantages tenants and generally speaking sort of the less disadvantaged, less powerful, less knowledgeable party. Um, if there were a world where tenants, um, if they did, if the parties did not settle on the first court date, the landlord had to produce discovery um, as sort of equivalent to sort of initial disclosures in the federal system. Um, I think that would go a long way towards giving tenants the information they need to actually be able to know what rights they have, know how, you know, their uh, likelihood of being able to win at trial, um, having the evidence they need to actually take their case to trial if they were to do that, um, and would sort of up the cost of litigation for landlords um, and put tenants in a stronger position to get good settlements. Thanks. Um, Fred, yeah. as, as Judge Martin uh, mentioned, you are the non-lawyer on the panel. Um, so I thought we'd lean into that, that perspective. Um, you know, your work is really multifaceted. You know, you don't just explore consumer debt litigation. You also look at consumer debt's role in society and how people experience it. Um, I thought given this broader scope of your work, I, I wonder what you think about the role of courts specifically, as opposed to, you know, other political institutions uh, or other, um, you know, social ways of problem solving uh, for when it comes to managing and ameliorating problems of consumer debt. Um, so uh, thanks, Danny, for the uh, uh, for warning the room uh, <laughs> about what's coming. Uh, so, uh, because I'm a sociologist, when I'm thinking about the role of courts, uh, the the way that I'm approaching it um, is much like the way that I would approach uh, the neighborhoods. Um, so, I'm looking at distributions. Um, I'm looking at design, and in the middle of all of this, I'm looking at sort of meanings and 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 the experience of of dignity or, or its opposite. And when I say distribution, so, so no, no one's surprised when a sociologist shows up and says things like, uh, we care about uh, what's happening in neighborhood census tracts and we can see that in some tracts you have really high unemployment, they're contiguous tracts. Uh, and you have some tracts uh, uh, where the life expectancy is really low and there are other things that are happening in those tracts uh, uh, so that we're able to say, if you are living in one of those places, uh, your life chances are downward sloping. Um, and what's really surprising to me is that it's much harder for us to say um, there are other things happening in those census tracts, uh, particularly court actions. And if you're living in one of those neighborhoods where you're experiencing a lot of those kinds of court actions in the neighborhood, uh, that your experience with justice, your understanding of justice is going to be different um, and your life chances will also be downward sloping by virtue of that. So, so, this, is, so this is one of the ways that, that we're thinking about it in terms of, of distributions and therefore the need for uh, geocoded data so that we can see um, not just where people live who are truly disadvantaged, but where a lot of uh, actions are happening um, and that seem to be to us a bit lumpy. Um, and so we, so we also we care about distributions. Um, we also care about design. So whenever we see that there's uh, lumpy distributions, we don't say, oh, you know, it just happens to be that birds with feather, uh, feather flock together. We're asking, is there something going on at, by way of design that's helping to create the patterns that we're seeing? Uh, and one of the ways that, that, that we try to investigate this is just by sort of walking in the shoes of uh, everyday people who are experiencing um, those kinds of institutions like the courts. And so one of the, the things that we have done in addition to um, interviewing uh, people who've been sued for their debts is I, I, I sent a group of students uh, the summer before the pandemic. Uh, you know, students are great. They'll just do whatever you, like you have a, like use public transportation, leave Princeton, go find that debt court, and then sort of write up some, some, some field notes from what you're seeing. And the first thing they noted was just how hard it was for them to figure out where the court was uh, and where the room was. They were like, they were, they were so nervous about getting to the right room. And when they got to the right room, they were like, I can't imagine sort of walking into a room like this for the first time and really being able to figure out sort of what to do or how to do it. Um, and so part of it is tr trying to sort of um, experience the court from the perspective of someone who's, who's sort of outside of it. Um, because one of the things that we do know is that 
even when the infrastructure is, is pretty good. Um, and so we, we do this with sort of some experiments around uh, uh, network, uh, sort of people's networks and how they mobilize resources in those networks. Even when they've got the right network structure, um, they will fail to uh, fully mobilize things that they know are available to them. Um, and by virtue of sort of uh, being an outsider or, or by virtue of the way that they are sort of entering into a particular situation. And so, so part of the, the, the thing that I like to try to uh, uh, make sure that I always uh, say when I'm in rooms like this um, is uh, that on the one hand, uh, there are things that get designed early on. And, and when I say, you know, that the outcomes that are, uh, that we don't like, um, are a matter of design. I'm not saying that people sat in a room, they were like, let's make people who are uh, having a hard time have an even harder time. There are, there are aspects of, of those institutional designs that are, that are emergent um, in terms of their uh, capacity for, uh, for uh, creating greater disadvantage. Uh, the other thing that we're saying around design is uh, it's not enough to talk about sort of how do we get better information to individuals. Uh, because the information is not going to be enough and the clarity and transparency will not be enough. We have to be really attentive to how people manage uh, the, the various types of um, uh, structures and information that, that are provided to them. So that's kind of how I've been thinking about this. Thank you. Um, I thought I'd open up for the panel as a whole, uh, just thinking about our, you know, our role as the, su the substance specific panel. Um, what are the levers that you all see um, that are substance specific for reform efforts? So, you know, I, I know I'm more familiar with the, the debt world than the housing world, but um, my impression, at least in the housing world, is that there's been uh, a lot of people, a lot of advocacy around the idea of the cost of eviction as just the social cost of eviction and the distributed cost of eviction as justifying public investment in, in attorneys, like that as an angle into the civil Gideon right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about, you know, something that is keyed into something to deal with specifically a housing issue or a debt issue as leverage for making the public case for reform. I just thought, you know, what are, what are other examples that maybe especially if you think they're underappreciated, or underutilized, or ones that you think are particularly effective any, anything else that, that people see in that area? I don't know how specific this is to consumer debt, but I think just the whole assembly line nature of consumer debt litigation. Um, obviously, it just um, there are a lot of potential solutions. Some are seem like no brainers, but maybe they're a lot more difficult to execute because of budget constraints. But you know, for instance, in the New York City civil courts, where we see most of these debt collection lawsuits being filed, the, the court files are all still on paper. And in New York State, you can enforce a judgment for at least 20 years. A lot of people think it's, or if, if you even know, think it's 20 years, but it's actually 20 years and it resets with every payment. So it could be forever. And so sometimes people are finding out about judgments even you know this week, I think we heard about judgments from 2010 or earlier, and then people are going to the courts and just trying to get the court files, and they can't get the court file. So they don't know anything about what's going on except for the name of the company that sued them. And if it's a debt buyer, they have no idea often who that company is. They don't have access to the affidavit of service, which would give the details about how they were supposedly served so they could make that argument in court. So they have basically no information. And then they're trying to challenge these really old judgments and it's really hard. And then you've got the other side, the, the debt buyer's attorney saying, well, we don't have it either because it's so old. Mm -hmm. And then what, what, what do you do with that? Well, so, so I think having, um, you know, moving more quickly towards getting court records um, electronically accessible to people would mean major improvements. It'd be a lot easier for people to help themselves and for advocates to help people. And um, we also see just, you know, that we, there could be a lot more training of court personnel and judges, all due respect to the judges in the room. But, um, you know, we just did some trainings for judges at the New York City Civil Court and you know, the judges were saying, oh, we're so thankful for this. We don't get any formal training on this topic. 
And, you know, I, I think we see that unfortunately reflected in some of the opinions that are put out where there's kind of a basic lack of understanding of personal jurisdiction or what are the proper methods of service in, under New York law or, you know, what kinds of funds are exempt from debt collection? What are the evidentiary requirements that debt buyers and other debt collectors would have to meet? So I think those, and I'm, I could go on again about <laughs> others, but those two would probably be top of my list. Um, I just wanted to chime in to say that I think um, a, a little bit similar to uh, thinking about the cost of eviction uh, representation be, and uh, thinking about making the case that way is that in some ways um, debt collection ends up working uh, against other funds that are public funds that are going to um, for example, food stamps or uh, welfare benefits that that consumers may receive, um, because unfortunately there are many cases where uh, a little bit like Nicole was talking about, where the, the settlements that people enter into uh, are often uh, going around these protections that consumers may have. So uh, consumers may be entering into these hallway agreements to um, pay money from exempt benefits, for example. So then you have a system where the debt collector is using a public entity, the courts, to enter into an illegal uh, agreement to collect or to obtain payments, which uh, are then gonna be made from social security, which is another public subsidy. So they're kind of doubly subsidizing uh, the debt collector in those cases. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, we do know that uh, there are some attorneys uh, representing debt collectors who are knowingly entering into those agreements, uh, knowing that that uh, consumers only source of funds are uh, public benefits. Another sort of housing example, I think, is around um, poor conditions and or substandard housing conditions where you know, I think now it's sort of through Matt Desmond's work and others it's sort of well known as Danny was saying, the sort of social cost of eviction. And I think um, the same thing could be said about poor housing conditions, um, which really are sort of now, unfortunately, an afterthought in a lot of housing courts. That's it's ironic because that's actually how a lot of housing courts, including in New York, really started was to address substandard conditions. Um, and now that's become sort of a much smaller port, uh, part of what a lot of housing courts are doing, um, both within eviction proceedings and outside of them. Um, but there are, um, and I think even you know within eviction proceedings, it's often sort of what's thought about last or um, sort of just as a side note. Um, but I think that's really unfortunate. I think there's a very strong case to be made and there's so much literature showing um, the social and economic impacts of living in poor substandard housing um, for the individuals who are experiencing it um, first and foremost how it leads to poor educational outcomes also to poor health um, social outcomes um, but then also for the affordable housing stock itself um, if the housing stock is deteriorating over time particularly the uh, housing stock that's going to low-income people um, that's eventually going to uh, leave and no longer be affordable housing stock, and that's a bad thing for everyone. Um, and so I think sort of that perspective um, could help courts sort of think differently about their role in helping ameliorate uh, substandard housing. And um, and the view from below when you're talking to people who have been summoned uh, to court. Uh, so um, so we sent out uh, an investigator journalist into some of the. The counties where we're tracking debt collection cases and we and newman and we said can you just can you find us some some you know some people have been summoned uh and we need a mix of people who actually went and the and some who who didn't go uh and and they all they all have opinions about sort of uh things that that should not have happened to them uh and one of those uh, some of the opinions that kind of em, uh, uh emerged uh from below was a sense that there, there are some uh uh, cases that you know they should not have been bothered with the case. Uh, so, so this particular uh, uh, person, uh, she had no, she had no recollection of the debt. She shows up. She asked for proof that that was her debt. The, he said he went through a big, a lot of papers, shuffling, and said, "Oh, I can't find it here, but it's probably back in the office." And they had to reschedule. Uh, she goes back the second time. He sees her in the hallway and says, we can make this easy on you and, and we'll, you know, we'll cut it way down because the reason this was urgent for her is, you know, here she is with her first, she had a couple of weeks out from having had a baby and 
there was a $6,000 hold on her bank account. You know, she, she needed this to be over, uh, but they were gonna cut her a, a, you know, cut her a break. Uh, but she decided in that, that particular instance to hold her ground. And she went in and goes, he's flat, going through the big envelope, going through the big envelope. And it looks like I'm about to be in some big trouble. And then he says, oh, I don't have it. And so it was thrown out. And so she wanted to know why is it that there's not some body somewhere who can at least go through and make sure that I don't, that, that there's documentations that why should I have to why would I why should I have to do that that's so hard for me to do and so when you talk to the people who are going through it uh, they will tell you that things like that are really bothersome uh, to them in terms of their sense of justice and I think the second thing that's really bothersome to them is just the sense that. Uh, they want to be treated as if, you know, they're honest and honorable, uh, because they say sometimes you, you're in these situations where people talk to you as if you never really, even if you know you owe it, they act as if you never really ever intended to pay what you owed. Um, and they just wanted someone who was willing to work with them. And so this mediation piece is really very important. So from, so from the, the view from out there uh, is that there's, you know, there's some things that really should not be allowed. Um, thanks. Uh, Susan, you mentioned the training of judges, which I think called to mind a question that I've been trying to think about recently, which is when you when you have these reforms, and this is not just a question for Susan, it's for, any, it's for anyone, um, but when you, when you have these reforms, how do you make sure that they stick? So I know one thing that I've heard about in the debt collection context is you might have a reform um, along the lines of requiring documentation when, when, when a complaint is filed, um, but that requirement may not always get observed. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, people may not hear about that requirement or, um, you know, with a if a defendant doesn't have a, a lawyer to point out that the requirement hasn't been observed, maybe no one's going to point out that the requirement hasn't been observed. So what are ways of trying to make sure that when these reforms, you know, when a reform is successfully, I don't want to say implemented, but, you know, like passed, it, you know, makes it through the formalistic check that it actually goes about operationalizing in the real world. Yeah, so much swirling in my head right now that I have to say. But um, I mean, over the years, I think um, our fellow advocates um, and I, we've gotten a lot of great legislative and policy reforms. And sometimes it's incremental. We, we get a, a policy change. So a memo goes out from the judge or the clerk, the chief clerk, and says, OK, this is how we're going to do things. And then there's very mixed application in, in practice. And then maybe we get to the next stage where we get it um, implemented as a full on court rule. Um, and then the the prize, I guess, is uh, when we can get a law on the books, and then there's just it's just more clear. Um, even you know we've had success in New York, even when we had some um, success getting some court rules that raised the standards of what documentation was required for default judgments. When I looked at the New York courts uh, e-courts database, I saw that after those rules went into effect, the filings by some of the biggest debt buyers like Midland Funding just basically plummeted to almost nothing um, because they had to regroup around this um, to figure out how they could do this. And then they were back, you know, they're back in full force now. Um, so, but, but, you know, some of the bigger ones you see it, I'm sure some smaller debt buyers fell by the wayside because of practices like that. Um, this law, uh, there is a law that we just got um, finally passed after, I think more than a decade of pushing for it. And, if I tell you what this law actually requires, you might be a little underwhelmed because one of the things the law requires is that the plaintiff identify the name of the original creditor in the complaint. And believe it or not, you know, I talked about these old judgments being enforced. When we finally get those court files, we will see pleadings from 2003, 2005 that have that do not identify the name of the original creditor, don't identify the account number in any way. So it's so hard. And I talked about how like people should get the court files, should be able to get the court files. That's an example of when you even get the court file, it doesn't really help you that much to figure out what's going on. So um, I'm going about on a, kind yeah, of on a detour, great. but I, I think once we have those rules, those um, laws in place, the judges and the clerks need a lot of training on those. And part of our training was on some of these, the, the new provisions of this law. Um, so they know what's going on. And, you know, I think it, there's, it, it can be slow to see the clerks um, adopt and in, implement a lot of these things, but I really think that's one of the highest priority uh, things that should be happening. It's also disappointing to see when 
you know, court personnel are prioritizing tasks that seem to benefit debt buyers and debt collectors over pro se defendants. So for instance, we don't see any delay in entering default judgments um, against pro se defendants where we see huge amounts of delay are for instance, getting affidavits of service into a court file or even getting a summons and complaint into a case file that the person can go make copies of. So we've seen people get noticed that they were sued um, go to court, try to get a copy of that affidavit of service, and it's just not there, and they're told it's going to take months. So advocates have to see what's going on. Um, you know, somebody mentioned the AG earlier. We work very closely with the Attorney General's Office in New York and try to report all of these problems, but um, I think we need um, all of these voices on the ground of advocates, but also the people who are experience the harm of these practices firsthand just to get their stories out there and to move the courts to make changes that will benefit them. I, I can talk, um, I know in the first panel, uh, the Justice for All um, convenings were, were discussed with these different states working through that process. And as part of the Massachusetts Justice for All um, meetings, there has, they have, we've created now under the Access to Justice uh, Committee, a group that is meeting monthly from the courts, from legal services, we're part of it, the AG's office is part of it, all meeting around consumer debt issues. And um, so that's one way that uh, this process has turned into a more systematic uh, way of having these touch points where we can identify problems as they're emerging in the courts and legal services are seeing them. Um, so some of the legal services groups have been doing um, court observations over the summer that then we turn into letters that then go to the trial contacts, uh, trial court contacts that have come about as part of this process. So I, I think that those have all been helpful. Um, the Attorney General's office in Massachusetts has also done trial court observations to try to identify practices and bring those up. Um, I, I know that the Attorney General's office, uh, office often in our state has particular access to court data that advocates don't always have. So they've been a, another vehicle to try to help access information that other advocates don't get to uh, access as easily and then or at all in many cases and then uh, you know in Massachusetts there is a superintendency process for the courts so uh, a legal services group in Lowell brought a superintendency case against the local court system the local trial court and um, said here's the rule the trial courts are not following this rule in, in our uh, jurisdiction. And so that case got filed directly with um, the single justice of the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. And there was then a process of resolving that complaint, um, which led to a working group um, and some reforms that haven't been implemented yet. So legal services uh, just was spearheading some efforts to continue that conversation. But those are a few levers that uh, they have used. So, I guess uh, so. On, on the first panel, there there was a I thought a very nice question that was kind of like you know let's let's uh, assume away some of the impediments that we that we often are are facing, um, and then do some you know sort of bigger picture imaginative work. I kind of want to ask the opposite question, um, which is like just getting very granular about the impediments. So, it, it seems like there are, you know some just it's always going to be a, a tough road to hoe uh, if you've got you know like. Court, court funding, raising taxes. You know, these are big questions that um, are, require heavy lifts. But do you, in your sort of day-to-day -day life or research or experience, encounter impediments that just seem like they shouldn't be there? You know, like frustrating small things that it doesn't seem like they're protecting any entrenched interest, but are still in the way of day-to-day -day life? Maybe the answer is no. Maybe like, or maybe, you know, only the impediments that are there are the ones that, that benefit someone. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to hear if people feel like there's just the sort of day-to-day -day, um, sand in the gears of, of these systems. 
One thing I can point to in the debt collection context, which was really, I think, problematized even more during the pandemic, because it was just that much harder for people to get to a post office or to staples to make copies or to get to a notary, um, was the requirement is the requirement that uh, people have to find someone else to serve papers for them. And so just to go about filing in order to show cause to ask the court to vacate a default judgment or to get a frozen bank account released and then have to freeze it, uh, uh, have to serve it and have to fill out an affidavit of service saying I'm over 18 and not a party to this action. That actually created a huge burden for so many people. I mean, it always has been for a lot of the people we work with who are you know, all low income, very busy, you know, everyone may know is busy, um, but was just it just made things almost impossible. Um, during the pandemic. And I think, you know, in practice, a lot of people do it themselves and then it's okay. But, you know, it's always a worry that we're going to tell them, look, if you really can't find someone, just do it yourself and hopefully it'll be okay. And then get the disappointing news that maybe they were criticized for that by the judge and then they have to go back and do everything again. So um, little things like that, I think. And I thought you were going to actually talk about notary reform. Wasn't there notary reform in New York? Yeah, I think they they, they allowed it by by video, but that did that actually in practice it was still hard for people because of you know their own tech savviness just like varied very greatly, and so it wasn't always um, it didn't mean the difference necessarily between getting something notarized or not. So Susan, not not to pick on you, but in your in your prior <laughs> in your prior answer, you had talked about um, a, a law that took you know, ten years to to get passed. Why did it take ten years? I'm just curious. Like, what what is the what is the process there? <laughs> Ooh, um, <laughs> there's a lot of politics there. I, I I think there was just a lot of resistance by the industry. Um, and by the legislators, um, you know, not all, but it was it was we we were successful in one house for many many years, but we couldn't get through the other house. But um, finally, we were able to. And I did say, you know, some of the provisions are underwhelming, but one of the biggest, I think, uh, great changes about this law is that it lowers the statute of limitations on consumer debt cases to three years, and whereas before it was three to six, which I think makes a big difference for people. They're getting notified about a problem more in a more timely manner and they're more likely to have documentation where they can establish well this is the wrong amount or this is not me so i think it's hopefully helping to also filter out a lot of lawsuits that shouldn't have been filed in the first place thanks well, i think maybe now would be a good time to open it up to questions from from the floor uh, if anyone else has questions or, or thoughts or perspectives that you'd like to share Is this on? I was kind of curious. I know you talked a lot about the kind of imbalance of power. And, uh, you know, I was curious about kind of the class action context, right? And you can aggregate a bunch of individual plaintiffs who are kind of similarly, similarly situated against a defendant. And in this context, it feels similar, but it's kind of flipped, right? You have a bunch of similarly situated defendants kind of against one institutional plaintiff. And I'm curious about ways to kind of aggregate defense kind of side advocacy. You know, I think you talk about regulation and changing the rules and kind of changing how the game is played. But I wonder if there are other ways, like I think about my student debt, and, you know, all the students who are similarly situated, if there are some ways kind of in our legal system to kind of challenge, the, you know, debt consolidation and those types of practices that might not involve pointing to a specific injury and how it's done and kind of bringing a class action that way. I don't know if that's kind of too roundabout. <laughs> so, I mean, there are um, obviously class actions that are filed under affirmative um, laws like the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and uh, state equivalents, the kind of mini FDCPAs and other uh, state debt collection laws. Um, I, I think that, you know, some of what happens with people who do debt defense work is just, you know, coming together and sharing practices and sharing who the actors are that are the bad actors. 
And then we go to the enforcers, you know, we go to the AG's office, we go to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and we say, here's the systematic uh, practice that we're seeing. And it's not just this one court where this is happening, but it's happening in all of these places. And so I think part of it is getting people together who do this work so that we can share those narratives and see where there are common practices and then bringing those stories. I, I don't know, maybe other people have other creative angles too. Yeah, I, to in, in the context of eviction, I think where you really see that is where there's strong tenant organizing and the tenant organizing work where they're connected with lawyers as well. So um, when I worked in the Boston area, we worked with a really strong um, community-based uh, movement organization called City Life Vida Urbana, and they would organize um, tenants either in a particular building or tenants across buildings who all have the same landlord, um, where there are particular sort of widespread bad practices going on or massive rent increases that are causing evictions. Um, and usually with legal services, so they'll do a whole sort of organizing campaign targeted that usually involve the city and the AG and try to sort of hit all the levers of power and then um, work closely with lawyers where we'll then agree to sort of take all of those cases to have sort of a coordinated effort against that bad practice. Um, and there are lots of success stories of that. I mean, lots of challenges in that model too, but um, tends to sort of cut, you know, be a strong force against the bad practice and will lead to some reforms. And you mentioned student loans, so I just want to highlight the Debt Collective, which uh, some of you may know about, but it's basically like a, a union of uh, student loan borrowers and other kinds of debtors and alleged debtors. And I, sorry, I'm just going to throw in one other thing that I, I do think that um, investigative reporters have been a really important part of telling these stories about bad, bad actors, um, in particular in the medical debt context, that uh, there's been amazing in-depth reporting that has gone through and really documented what the practices are of particular hospitals and really force the hospitals to look at their actions and reevaluate. And, and some of these hospitals have really uh, substantively changed their debt collection practices as a result. I was going to ask a follow-up question about sewer service, just because the industry has taken these sort of stinging, you know, and expensive defeats. And I know there's been innovation around uh, geomapping where process servers are. But what I can't quite understand is like the exact state of play today. Is it still a, a you know everywhere a problem or not? From what we see, and um, you know, we operate this hotline for low-income New York City residents, and we are in very close contact with our colleagues in legal services who work in the consumer debt area around the city and around the state. Um, but especially in the city, yes, it's still a huge problem despite those reforms, unfortunately. Um, so that goes for current lawsuits, but also, um, you know, this goes a little bit beyond, beyond, I think, what you were trying to get at. But, um, you know, the legacy of all the sewer service that has happened in these cases over the years, and I mentioned that judgments are enforceable in New York for at least 20 years, is, is there's so much of that sewer service that happened before that people today have to grapple with because they don't learn about a judgment until five, 10, 15, 18 years later. And so that due process issue I mentioned earlier where we're trying to bring this appeal to tell the courts, you can't just give people one year to challenge a judgment from when they learn about it because these people are low income. They've got so much life just going on and they often just don't know that there's any way they can, any way to challenge it. They've never been to court before. And actually our client in this appeal, she only found out about this, that's the fact that she could do something because she started working overtime to compensate for the wage garnishment that was happening. The fact that she was working overtime led her, her um, government housing provider to raise her rent. And then she couldn't afford the rent. And then she got called into the housing court and she was notified that she was sued in housing court. So she went to housing court and that's where she met a lawyer who said, oh, why can't, you know, what's going on? She goes, well, I've got this wage garnishment. Oh, did you know that you could challenge this? And so that didn't happen until a few years later. She's, and then she called us, she went to court and she challenged it and the court said, you just waited too long, that's it. Um, 
So I think, you know, the problem with sewer service maybe has gotten slightly better. It's still a huge problem, especially among debt collectors. And it's still that horrible legacy of 20 plus years of sewer service that we're trying to help people get out from under. Uh, hi, um, good afternoon. A uh, couple of questions. Um, first on something that the panel touched on before regarding um, more process in the consumer debt uh, uh, litigation area um, to uh, slow down the pace um, at, of uh, assembly line uh, plaintiffs. Um, I have handled some uh, debt collection cases in the past, and I know uh, e-filing um, has, you know, there are, and there are certain courts that are that are still paper filing, but uh, the, a, a lot of courts now uh, have gone to e-filing. Um, is there uh, an examination of ways to implement, for example, um, the evidentiary standards that a plaintiff needs to provide chain of title, um, proof of chain of title in the complaint in, into the e-filing system so that, you know, when you upload a complaint, you also have to upload, a uh, you know, exhibit A, the original instrument, exhibit B, uh, assignment to the debt buyer as exhibit C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, as a sort of a procedural break, uh, even before the, the complaint gets filed so that, um, you know, at, at the very least, it, it, it slows the process for assembly line uh, litigation to the point where, yes, they are actually forced to provide that uh, a chain of title. Um, the second question is um, uh, more along the lines of uh, limited uh, legal assistance to pro se plaintiffs, or I'm, I'm sorry, pro se defendants, um, both in uh, eviction and, and consumer debt. Um, is there uh, a sort of a, a line that advocates draw in terms of you know providing legal information versus legal advice um, where you can counsel a, uh, a defendant on certain strategies for example if they do happen to get served um, and, and you know not not just sewer service but they actually have been served and they, don't exactly know how to respond um, rather than risking default, just file an answer. You know, uh, there even just a form answer that you can get off of the court's website, just say, deny, 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 deny. You know, even if, even if the debt is a legitimate debt, just deny so that you force the collection uh, plaintiff to the higher standard of a summary judgment, for example, instead of a default judgment. Um, is there a line that's crossed between legal information and legal advice if you provide that information or is that, or, or are there these sort of litigation tactical strategies um, that could be provided to defendants? Thank you. So I guess in terms of uh, programs that are, uh, providing services to consumers who have been sued uh, in a collection lawsuit. Um, one innovation that I think is pretty widespread, if not in all 50 courts now, is unbundled legal services and um, allowing attorneys to represent individuals for a portion of a case, whether that is a lawyer for the day program that that's that's, I would be your attorney for the day. And we sign a, a, an agreement so that you understand that I'm not your attorney if this case goes on necessarily, but I'm representing you today. So a lot of programs around the country have used that when they're doing uh, representation in court. And then um, outside of court, you can also have that model. So there are programs that are also working with consumers outside of court and you can come in and I will I will be your lawyer for the drafting of this answer. 
and I will work with you to draft this answer. And, and so I think that that's really been an important reform for um, legal services programs that are providing assistance in the debt collection and eviction to arena. Yeah. Eviction, it's similar. So in, in Massachusetts, like um, there's a lot of support for legal services providers and help assisting pro se um, defendants in eviction cases uh, uh, produce answers on their, with sort of limited assistance on their own. So there's a um, pro se answer form that's like very, um, sort of in detail drafted by legal services providers, everyone sort of weighs in, it's like 11 pages long, like you're going through like every possible defense or counterclaim that the defend that a tenant could have. Um, it's constantly updated. So what legal services providers traditionally have done is that they've um, held clinics. Um, it's like in sort of the pre-pandemic world, it would be like on a single, usually like a Friday before the answers due because of the structure of deadlines in Massachusetts. Um, and usually legal services providers would actually send out letters to uh, tenants just based on the filing documents in the courthouse, um, encouraging them to come in to get assistance with their answer. It would help them in sort of a group setting um, and also assist them with the filing and service of it. Um, those still go on in sort of different forms in the pandemic world. Um, and now it's also that same form is also available online. Um, and a clinic at Suffolk Law School actually created a way, a like really great sort of tool for tenants to be able to fill that out in a very sort of consumer friendly way and also file it and serve it and sort of walk them through that more than just like downloading and printing the form. Um, and that's been really great. Yeah, so I, I wanted to also um, return to the e-filing form, uh, or sorry, the e-filing question about whether forcing people, uh, plaintiffs who are filing cases to file the addi additional documentation can cut down on the number of filings or at least act as a break. Um, so I think potentially one thing that uh, I, I can say that happened though in, in Massachusetts was once additional documentation rules were put in for credit card uh, claims, lawsuits around credit cards. Um, we saw many plaintiffs just incorrectly choosing the wrong case type so that they didn't have to file the additional documents to move forward. And, and so, um, you know, they're, they're just, I don't know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I don't know. So all the current judges in the room will hate me for saying this, but as a retired judge, I think the debtors ought to just ask for a trial in the case. I don't know how many times I've had people come in and say, well, I know I owe something, but I don't think I owe this much. And then you set it for trial. I mean, they're coming in saying, you know, I was at the hospital for stitches and I don't think I, you know, used four boxes of Kleenex at $25 a box. And you just set it and these cases just fold like a house of cards. Same with mortgage um, uh, foreclosure cases. People come in say, I, you know, I tried to redeem, I sent them a check, they sent the check back to me, they give me different amounts all the time, it's a moving target. And we would, I was in Aurora County in Illinois, and we'd have all these um, Chicago firms that bundled all these mortgages. And, you know, I set one for trial, and they just folded, you know, they said, Okay, we'll just take the house back, we're not going to go after the deficiency. We had a judicial education conference in Illinois. There were 75 judges on mortgage foreclosure. I asked, has anyone in this room ever actually tried a mortgage foreclosure case? And they never have. It's, uh, I, I'm allowed to go on Illinois Legal Aid online and give advice to, uh, to debtors. And I say, if you can, in good faith, file something with the courthouse, saying that I do not believe I owe this much on this debt and ask for a trial in the case, they usually fold. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just say in, in response that a lot of uh, consumers' experiences in the system is if they even make it to the courthouse um, or uh, in, into interacting with the court system, a lot of what we see is that um, 
people are immediately directed to speak in the hallway or in another room with the representative uh, who's representing that creditor. And, and so a lot of times people simply don't ever get the message that they have a right to have their side heard and that they might have legitimate defenses and that um, there, there are uh, potential um, solutions through the court system, I guess. And the other thing is for people who maybe do get that message, many of them think, I don't have the time because, you know, if I just sign something right now, maybe I can still make it to work uh, this morning and uh, not lose a full day's wages. If I otherwise uh, am going to fight this, I would have to wait until second call, which may be hours from now, and, and I don't have the time for that, or I, I'm going to lose too much money. I think. No, go ahead. I think in a for, so it's interesting hearing the, in the foreclosure context. So I practice in a non-judicial foreclosure state. I know that um, Illinois is a judicial foreclosure state. So in Massachusetts, the way it worked was that um, the foreclosure just happened through the papers. And then um, the way, you know, borrowers could, of course, file an affirmative case, which very few did. Um, but the way that they could had an opportunity to litigate it um, sort of where they didn't have to file their own case was um, in the eviction process. And um, I was a law student during that time. That's sort of why I like, grew up in that world. And um, it really took so much litigation for the courts to impose any sorts of requirements sort of in the prima facie stage of the case. Um, they just granted banks judgments. And after legal services litigated everything and forced them to, you know, show the note that they own the note that they had a chain of uh, assignment etc um, that changed a little bit but initially at least for many many years um, it was you know if if um, the former owner were to take the case to trial um, the banks had to show so little um, to get the judgment and I guess I would just say um, it depends a lot on the judge before I want to embrace that <laughs> um, wholeheartedly, uh, I think, you know, I would want the judge to know what the evidentiary requirements are that a debt buyer um, employee can't be the one to testify because they don't have personal knowledge about the fact that the defendant allegedly opened this account, you know, years before the debt buyer even bought the account. And also to speak to what Fred was saying earlier, I think for our hotline callers, the idea of having a trial for most of them would be just absolutely terrifying. And what we do for the very few trials that do happen, we actually, you know, I practiced, um, I actually represented defendants for many years. Now we do this limited scope legal assistance, but in those years I practiced, I never went to trial. I can probably count on two hands the number of colleagues who've had a debt collection trial. Um, but those who do have that experience, we turn to them and we say, what can we do to advise our hotline caller who now has this unfortunate prospect of this trial before them? And that's usually because the judge hasn't caught all of the evidentiary problems before that and gotten it, let it get to that point. Yeah, so I'll just say one thing about trial, uh, depending on what neighborhood <laughs> you're living in. Uh, so uh, I was uh, sitting, I won't say uh, where, uh, with a particular uh, police chief. Uh, and she noted that uh, sometimes they would have people come in uh, and, and they would sort of show up and they, they would throw their hands in the air and they're like, okay, I'm surrendering myself. Um, because they had a court summons uh, for that, and their assumption was the only thing that was going to happen to them at the court was they're going to be taken away, and and this was in a in a context and coming out of a neighborhood where usually any contact with uh, the justice system is a contact that is that means that you're being taken uh, taken away, um, and so I think part of the the challenge will be. Uh, in communities where uh, where you're tr trying to sort of really uh, turn change the narrative about uh, what the courts do and what the courts can do, you're going to need trusted um, allies who are already working in those communities, uh, because having an outsider say, "Don't worry, uh, the courts really are there for you," uh, it's just not even if it's true. Um, it won't be enough to kind of get the kind of outcome that you're hoping to get. So Mark, I, I want to say I'm not offended at all by what you just said in terms of encouraging people to exercise their legal rights. And later today, we're going to talk about ways that we can
reduce that time cost, that, 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 that horrible thing that happens. When you're dealing with folks that, you know, they're, they're, on, um, they're, they're on an hourly wage, they just can't afford the time and how we can use different types of processes um, to be able to accommodate that. I have a question for Professor Wary. And this is triggered off of the discussion that I listened to last night where he was explaining his work, but also his introduction today. And, and it has to do with scalability of your work. The, because if I understand correctly, your work helps us identify specific barriers, specific problems, either in the entry into the system into, or in terms of the process itself. And so my question is a kind of a generic question, but if you can give us some specifics, of that'd be great. How can we scale your work that will, so that we can build tools that will help us address, identify, and then specifically address those areas? How can, how can we scale that? Yeah, I'll scale. So, um, so, so there are two entry points where I think we can, we can really think about uh, scale. Um, on the one hand, there's work being done by places like Access to Justice and, and others, uh, where you can see just the making language both uh, simpler, but a little bit more respectful and inviting and can, can make a huge difference in terms of uh, sort of a, the way a person then responds to a summons or, or other communications from the court. And that you can, you can sort of scale and test. Uh, there's another uh, place uh, on the side of data that is amenable for geocoding uh, that is scalable so long as courts are willing to sort of uh, let sort of some basic information be available to, to the public. Now that's really scalable and in, in a way that we can sort of think about distributions and think about hotspots and think about sort of serial filers and, and that's completely scalable. Um, but we have to get realistic about sort of the kinds of resources that courts need to do that. Because every time you people say, oh, just make data transparent and available, it just, it sounds so easy, um, the waving of the wand. And, and that's, you know, personnel, uh, that's uh, uh, even emotional support uh, to, to get that data right and to get it sort of going to the right places. That would make a huge difference in terms of letting the public feel as if uh, not only are we uh, are the courts here for us, but they are also transparent. Um, and they are so transparent that we can figure out if there are things happening that with disparate impacts across particular kinds of communities where we might sort of think about uh, needed intervention. So that's those are the two areas where I think uh, we could have some scalable, although in some cases not as quick as we'd like uh, uh, interventions. Is there a question back there? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I understood something correctly. In these debt collection cases, what I thought I heard was that there's no facial sufficiency requirement. There's nothing that has to be pled with specificity um, by a plaintiff. You can have a debt collector who bought a debt just sue somebody and say, you don't know me, but you owe me X amount from 20 years ago. And that's not going to, to be dismissed for facial insufficiency right off the bat. That will be allowed to proceed. Until May 7th, I think 2022, that was true. That's when the, that law I mentioned went into effect that had those specific pleading requirements. And that is nationwide, or this is a state? I'm talking about New York State, yeah. Okay, so it's still in some states, um, an unknown party, you can get a lawsuit from someone you've never heard of saying you owe me money from 2010. And they don't have to give you a date or a time or a prior company or anything. So the law is gonna vary in every state around this. Um, so there are states that have taken steps to, as I was talking about earlier, require additional information to be filed or to be specifically pled in the complaint. But uh, there are absolutely jurisdictions where um, 
you know, it, it is a notice pleading standard. And if you don't file an answer, if an answer is required, um, or if you don't um, show up for the hearing, if, if you there's no answer required uh, and um, actually challenge that, then they would be entitled to a default um, or a default judgment, depending on how the system is set up. And uh, so, in terms of the kind of statute of limitations issues, I think that judges would say that's an affirmative defense that has to be affirmatively pled unless the laws in, in that jurisdiction require um, a, a specific pleading, like an affirmative statement that this is within the statute of limitations or something along those lines. Now, is that a violation of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act to sue people on a time bar debt? Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the Regulation F that was just promulgated by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau made that very clear. Um, and law was quite clear even before that. But, um, you know, there, there are practices that would be allowed under state rules that would violate the FDCPA. Okay, well, time barred, yeah, I'm just thinking of that differently from lack of specificity. If, yes. if there is an answer put out that says this complaint against me lacks any detail or specificity that would help me to recognize what this plaintiff is referring to, in your experience, have judges dismissed these complaints for lack of detail or specificity, or it only, is done that way if there was a specificity requirement in the jurisdiction to begin with. So what I would say is very few consumer defendants file the answer um, and or show up again, depending on what's required in the jurisdiction to defend. So I, you can, I don't know if you want to comment too. Yeah, I mean, I think in practice, you know, I, I mentioned this law went into effect just a few months ago, but in, in practice, you know, a lot of debt buyers have been saying, you know, this is a resident creditor, there might still be some other key info that's missing, but they kind of, they have their boilerplates and they're often identifying what they call the predecessor and in interest. But again, it's still a problem because, you, um, we still help people with these very old judgments that only surface for them for the first time many years later. And then you will find that the underlying court file doesn't have that specificity. And you know the other side will just keep referring to the original creditor as the predecessor in interest without naming them because they actually don't seem to know either. So it's again that, that legacy problem of all of these old judgments that are considered valid judgments. And sewer service, um, just to, you know, the problem's gotten actually better in New York State, I think thanks to a lot of the reforms over the years, but it probably reached its peak in 2008 where 300,000 cases were filed just that year in New York City civil courts. And I think 75% of those cases resulted in default judgments. So most of these cases, and, and we think the biggest reason for those, that default rate is sewer service. So most of those complaints are not even getting to anyone's eyes. They're just going through a rubber stamp process where it's just like, here are the papers, okay, check, check, and you know they get their judgment. Um, so it's, it's less of a problem, this lack of specificity, um, except for those really old cases that come up for people many years later. Um, all right, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So for a lot of the defendants who are faced with the initiation of a case, they're in a place of, of hopelessness or inertia or just really busy, complicated lives. And so what is the best way for courts to notify and ultimately recruit and enroll these folks in either court-operated programs of assistance or court-adjacent programs of assistance? Because I'm from Miami. Our experience in several instances in the past, particularly with foreclosures, is getting people to engage and, and getting to them in the first, like getting to open the mail alone was a huge challenge. And do you have any suggestions for overcoming this? And Professor Wary, if you would start first. Uh, so, so I think we heard this morning for, for about some work that's being done in terms of both the changing the communications, but also the reminders of thinking about just a text reminder even um, and what that can do. Uh, 
Uh, the other thing that, that's happening is um, uh, sort of partnerships outside of the court. So uh, just as there was this bail project uh, done uh, to, uh, that was outside of the court uh, to help people who sort of could not make bail uh, and, to, and to then enlist those people who had benefited from the program to help with outreach to, to others who needed that help. Uh, this, one of the people involved in that is uh, is visiting us, he's non-residently visiting us down in Princeton from, from New York because he has a job in here, uh, to do to look at how do you do the same thing for debt collection? How do you disrupt debt collection, uh, perhaps in partnership with courts, and in a way that then allows the people who benefited from the disruption to then become part of the outreach? Um, and so, so I think part of it is, uh, yes, you're going to need to sort of do some of these um, things like the communications and the text messaging, but you're also going to need to enlist those people who become the beneficiaries of the program for there to sort of build up uh, legitimacy. I hate to use the term street cred because I have none, um, it, but, but to sort of build that sense that sense of trust and legitimacy uh, in the kinds of innovations that, that it will roll out. Um, I think, oh, well, actually, no, it looks like we have some more time. Yeah. Well, I, I could ask a, a question just in the utopian abolitionist uh, disruption direction. Maybe that's a nice way to end, or maybe it's just too naive, but, but whose idea was this debt consolidation resale business in the first place? And, and do we have to live with it? Like, why is it legal to consolidate debt, you know, and pursue it, you know, at, at, at this very discounted rate? Is that just the American way? So, I, I mean, I think that the history is I have received it, um, not based on my own original research, is that uh, debt buying in this form originated after the savings and loan crisis and uh, accounts then being sold off uh, at a discount as a result of that. Um, I, you know, I think that Unfortunately, this is another area where we don't have all the data that I would like. And um, the one entity that I knew of that was collecting data about how much debt was being bought and sold stopped doing it and publishing it in 2013. So what I can tell you from that data is that 2005 was a, a kind of high water mark for, for the um, sale of a lot of this consumer uh, debt. Um, but I, I definitely think we need more information about what's out there and what's happening. Um, and I think it, it's an area that needs a lot of scrutiny and um, continues to be uh, a, a real problematic area for consumers in terms of consumer debts, understanding who this entity is, obtaining information and documentation about the accounts. But um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any it just makes me think how, you know, with the explosion of debt buyers and the debt buyer lawsuits, um, what happened was, I think, because they were flooding the courts with so many cases, somehow the prevailing kind of attitude was, um, we're, we'll, we'll kind of lower our standards to meet their business model instead of requiring their business model to be elevated to the point where they could actually meet the requirements. So even though we have this new law, which is really great, even the requirements back then should have been enough to keep out probably all of those kinds of lawsuits. And I think sometimes there's a sense that, oh, well, these are low dollar cases and therefore the courts don't want to spend too many resources or, or, you know, we need to make these more efficient. But I guess my perspective is this is a case like any other civil case and this plaintiff needs to prove its case because it's simply not true that all of these people who've been sued actually owe A, any money or be the amount that they've been sued for. And um, yeah, I think that it's really important to keep that frame of mind as we're, we're thinking about these cases um, and, and thinking about what reforms might actually be able to help consumers. Can I just add to that? You know, when we talk about consumer debt cases, you know, the, I think sometimes they're kind of the stepchild of these other, um, when you look at them among other cases. So it's, 
you know, obviously housing cases are super important, foreclosure cases, because you have your housing immediately at issue. And there's so many other kinds of cases, immigration cases, but consumer debt cases, what we've seen is the consequences of a judgment mean frozen bank accounts, mean wage garnishments, which have an immediate impact on people's ability to pay their rent. So it does get to housing. It does get to their ability to buy food, um, medication, et cetera. So I think we all want to try to get everyone to think more about how important each of these cases can be um, in terms of their impact on someone's lives. And I, I know this is about state courts, but I do want to say, you know, all the people that we work with, they're dealing with this debt collection stuff at this end, but at the beginning of the process, they were probably, you know, victims of like all of the abusive and discriminatory bank practices and other practices, credit reporting issues, what I've heard people call predatory inclusion, like we'll include you in the financial system, but on these predatory terms. And that really gets them into this path where it's so hard for them to get out of it. And then when they're hit with debt collections, um, you know, calls and letters and then litigation, it's really hard for them to get out of it. But I don't want to end on such a downer. <laughs> I just want to say something good. I mean, had a utopian, Optimistic. A utopian yeah. question, but right. not a utopian answer, sadly. Right. Right. Um, but I do, you know, maybe maybe the lunch will, uh, will revitalize us. I don't want to keep everyone from the food just for the sake of, of, of utopianism. So thank you to the panelists. Um, <laughs> and thank you to everyone here for the question.